So I got through the the last three videos. They were all from here in Athens. Two of them were the unsolved uh, cases on Jenny Stone and Tara. But from this point on, I'm going to be doing some more in-depth stories. I have submitted Freedom of Information Act requests for these, and I have gotten crime team photos and all that stuff. So we're going to be going into detail. I have just a couple more videos that I want to tell from here in Athens. So I'm only going to be here a few more days. And I'm starting off this video here in the downtown area. And back in 2009, the University of Georgia, which is just right across the street from me here, and the Athens community, they were upended when a popular UGA professor, he was everyone's favorite teacher, he just, he lost it one day and he went on a murder spree across Athens, Georgia, and then disappeared out of sight. It caused a multi-week manhunt to take place that was across the country and it would go down as Athens, Georgia's largest manhunt ever. This UGA professor had recently found out that his wife, the mother of his children, that she had been seeing another man and he found out that she was going to be ending their marriage to be with this other man. After everything was all said and done, four people were killed, including the wife, her new boyfriend, an innocent bystander, and this professor. It's a wild and crazy story of infidelity and murder at the hands of University of Georgia professor George Zinkin. No one believed that he was capable of doing this, but it just goes to show you how crazy and how jealous love can make people. You never know what your significant other is capable of doing and, until it happens. Today I'm going to be tracking down all the locations and I'm going to be sharing all the details with you from this crazy story, the 2009 triple murder suicide that was committed by Professor George Zinkin. It's a wild story. It really is. As I said in the intro, today's story brings us back to the University of Georgia. And I realized that a lot of the videos, well, so far, two out of the three I've done from here, they've all surrounded around the University of Georgia. And there's a reason for that. And that's because I chose to come here because of the college campus, the University of Georgia, knowing that, um, you know, a lot of things like this happen around college campuses. Thousands of people are on this campus day in and day out. So it's no wonder that you get a few bad apples here and there. Now, for today's story, like I said in the intro, we're talking about Professor George Zinkan, who was a professor here at Georgia for some time. But he wasn't always a professor here. By 1981, George Zinkin had a bachelor's degree in English literature and a master's in business administration. He had also received his doctorate in business administration as well from the University of Michigan. Teaching, just that was George's forte. It was his calling, and he wasted no time jumping right into the fold after receiving his doctorate. George Zinkin was hired by the University of Houston in Texas as their like head of marketing, as their professor of marketing. He would go on to hold that position for 13 years, but not without complications. In George's final year at the University of Houston, this would have been in 1993, two women came forward and claimed that George had sexually harassed them. The two women came forward and ousted him but the whole situation was quickly settled out of court without a trial. A confidentiality agreement was signed as part of the settlement and the university paid both women to never speak about the event ever. Although the university went to great lengths to protect George and his future, they didn't want him at that university anymore because of what happened. So some of the higher ups and some of George's friends at the University of Houston, they reached out to some of their uh, friends and fellow colleagues at other universities. And in 1994, 
George Zinkin was hired here at the University of Georgia as their head of marketing. From 1994 until 2009, George would work here at Georgia's uh, Terry College of Business, and he also held a coveted spot on the Coca-Cola Company's Board of Directors. While he was a professor here at Georgia, he had an impeccable record as a teacher and a respected professor. Students and colleagues described him as a genius and that he was charming and a little peculiar. He would teach his classes walking around barefoot and he would have his shirt untucked. It wasn't like your normal uh, you know, business relationship that most professors tend to, uh, tend to do while they're holding their classes. George Zinkin's time here at Georgia would not go as smoothly as some would hope. And over the more than a decade that he was here in Athens, several complaints were filed by women. For example, several times he had asked some young female assistants that he had to copy some pornographic literature for him, and that made them feel uncomfortable. A couple of female students actually came forward and admitted to having affairs with him in exchange for better grades, and they admitted to even having sex with George in his office right here inside of this building. Although these accounts were listed in George's folder, no disciplinary actions were ever handed down to him for these inappropriate encounters with his female students. In 2001, another situation was listed in his folder as well, where another professor accused George Zinkin of tampering with her student evaluations. An investigation confirmed that Zinkin did in fact use his access to their computer systems to go in and remove numbers from this other professor's numerical grading scale, which in turn allowed the students in this other class to get better grades. It's believed that George did this to aid some of his female students whom he had who he may have been having affairs with or wanted to have an affair with, it's believed he did it to aid them so that they got better grades. Remarkably though, once again, no disciplinary action was taken against George Zinkin and he was just let go to continue teaching. Because of the university's lack of action after the investigation, the remaining few years that George taught here at Georgia, they were full of turmoil and arguments. George and this other professor continuously butted heads and both of their files were full of complaints against each other. The other professor filed complaints against George multiple times a week and then George would in turn file complaints against that other professor multiple times a week in retaliation. It was a mess. And this ultimately resulted in George stepping down as the head of George's marketing department. Although rumors swirled that him stepping down was because of his ongoing issues with this other professor, George issued a statement simply saying that, I mean, he was just tired and it was time to give someone else a turn to serve. During George Zinkin's multi-decade career teaching business and marketing, despite his controversies and setbacks, George managed to publish over 100 different articles in peer-reviewed academic journals, and he also received an award for outstanding contribution to research from the American Academy of Advertising. Combined, these achievements, they're very prestigious. And if you didn't know about some of the other things George had done, his inappropriate um, actions, I guess you could say, with female students, if you were just like on the outside looking in, you would think that he was at the very top of his field. By early 2009, George had began stepping back his duties here at the University of Georgia, perceivably because of his regular altercations with this other professor. Teaching was just no longer fun for him. When every day consisted of arguing and fighting between the two of them, it just wasn't fun. So in an attempt to get away from and distance himself from it a little bit, George and his wife, local Athens attorney, Marie Bruce, they began making regular trips to Amsterdam on vacations. It didn't take long and they actually bought a home over in Amsterdam and George even started teaching classes over there part-time when he was in the area. This was what the couple had always worked for. They were traveling between multiple countries, between the two of them, they had plenty of money coming in. They really didn't have to worry about anything. And they were both respected in their fields. Just a few months later though, in March of 2009, all of this would fall apart and come crashing down for George Zinkin. That March, George began to suspect that his wife, Marie Bruce, 
he, he began to suspect that she had started having an affair. There would be times where the two of them were supposed to go to Amsterdam, and then all of a sudden, like right before they would leave to get on the airplane, Marie would back out, forcing George to have to leave for multiple days by himself, which then in turn left Marie at home by herself. George almost immediately noticed that their relationship had changed and Marie Bruce had started becoming more and more distant from him every day. Suspecting that she may be talking to someone else, George decided to investigate and try and find out what was really going on, and he was right. His wife was having an affair. George secretly recorded conversations between his wife and this other man. Then on his computer, he had photos of his wife and this other man meeting at different locations around Athens. And on at least one occasion, we know that George canceled a trip to Amsterdam, but didn't tell anyone and he secretly watched everything that his wife did while she believed that he was out of the country. She spent the whole time with this other man and I guess George just followed him around and video recorded him or whatever. George Zinkin was crushed. After gathering up enough evidence, he confronted Marie Bruce about her affair with this other man. And although we don't know exactly what was said in this confrontation, from this point on, it was pretty clear that George knew that his marriage was coming to an end. At first, George was actually going to do the right thing and he was just going to divorce Marie. He began planning to leave Athens and he even had an interview at the University of Alabama in their marketing department. But for whatever reason though, before any of that could play out, April the 25th of 2009 would happen and for everyone involved, their lives would never be the same again. The morning of April the 25th of 2009 seemed to be just a normal morning for most people here in Athens. A theater group that performed here out of this theater, they were known as the Town and Gown Players. They were having a picnic reunion that day here out front of the theater. This is, uh, this is called the Athens Community Theater and it's located near the University of Georgia and um, this theater group they put on several performances and a couple of musicals each year but that April the 25th they were having this reunion picnic out front for the current cast members and cast members of years past so they could all get together and just have fun well Marie Bruce was part of the town and gown players so she was attending this picnic that day on this day George it just so happened that that same morning, George happened to figure out that not only was his wife a part of this community theater, but so was the man that she had been having an affair with. It immediately clicked for George Zinkin. His wife, she was spending the day with her lover right behind his back. So for whatever reason, after George had this realization, he lost it. And about 11 o'clock a.m., he loaded up his two youngest children into his car. It was a Jeep Liberty, and his two kids, they were 8 and 12. And with his two children buckled up in the back seat of this car, he drove from right here at their home all the way across town to right here at this community theater. George pulled up out front of the Athens Community Theater here at about 1130. He pulled over here into the parking lot and he immediately spotted his wife, Marie Bruce, standing out front of the theater with her lover, a man named Tom Tanner. It wasn't just those two out front. There were more than a dozen people out here that were, you know, just communicating and having a good time, but he had tunnel vision and he focused solely on those two so he gets out of his car, leaving the kids behind, and he walks up and he confronts Marie about her spending the day with this Tom. And then they get into this heated argument right out front of the theater here. At some point, George gets so angry that he just walks away and he walks back over to the Jeep Liberty. He gets something out of the back. And then he walks right back over. He pulls a gun out from behind his back and he fires one shot into Tom Tanner's head, killing him instantly. He then turns the gun to his wife. He fires another shot, killing her instantly. And then over here was a, a friend of theirs who starts walking that way to help. And George fires a third round, killing him instantly as well. All of that went down right here. 
All three people were killed right here. As soon as those three people had been shot and killed, George quickly walked back over to his Jeep Liberty and he floored it out of the parking lot here, leaving the area as quickly as he possibly could. As George shot and killed all three people out front of the community theater, there was at least a dozen witnesses out front on the scene. They all knew George because of his marriage to Marie. So immediately after George fled, they called 911 and within minutes, law enforcement was here on the scene and investigating what happened. And obviously as law enforcement talked to all these witnesses, the name George Zinkin kept coming up. Within just a couple of hours of the murders, an arrest warrant was issued for, for George Zinkin for three counts of first degree murder. During this time, neighbors here in the area around George and Marie's home, they all watched as a SWAT team kicked in George and Marie's front door. They were going in searching for George, but he was nowhere to be found. While law enforcement was on the scene, they were like, you know, looking through his house and searching it for evidence. A neighbor walks up and says that George had just recently been to their home. He had dropped off both of his two children. Like I said, they were eight and 12. And he said um, that this happened about 30 minutes prior to law enforcement arriving on the scene. He said that George pulled up out front of his house and he was kind of frantic. And he asked if this neighbor could watch his kids for a little while. The neighbor said that George said that he had some kind of an emergency going on and he didn't want his children involved. The neighbor had done this a few times before for the Zinkins. So this neighbor agreed to watch them and they watched as George quickly walked back out to his Jeep and squealed tires nearly leaving the driveway this encounter between george and their neighbor it was the last time that anyone would see george zinkin alive ever again as the day turned into evening and george had not been found law enforcement scoured his home and they came right here to the university and they went through george's office which is right here inside of this building this is also the building that i said earlier where, where several girls said that they were having an affair and had had sex with george here but the officers came here and they searched through his office and they started looking for clues as to where george might have gone while law enforcement was searching george's office in here it was here that they discovered the secret recordings that he had made when he was trying to figure out if his wife had been cheating on him or not and it was also at this time where they discovered evidence that george had kept about his extramarital affairs that he had had with his female students and they discovered that just prior to the murders taking place george purchased plane tickets to fly to amsterdam which the tickets were scheduled for just a few days after this on may the 2nd of course the discovery of these plane tickets disturbed law enforcement because if George managed to get on a plane to fly to Amsterdam, it would be really hard to be extradited from Amsterdam back to the United States. So instantly officers were dispatched at Atlanta International Airport and any of the smaller surrounding airports to watch for George to make sure that he did not get on a plane and leave the country. The next day on April the 26th, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation issued a federal arrest warrant for George Zinkin, and they charged him with unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. They, they weren't charging him with getting on a plane or anything like that. This was just uh, because he was running. He, you know, they hadn't found him. A whole week would go by with no sign of George Zinkin after this. He was, they couldn't find him anywhere. And because of that, this triggered the largest manhunt in Athens, Georgia's history. The Athens community was fearful that George could just murder three people in broad daylight and then get away. And they were worried, what if he came back and did it to them? So people were scared because he was still on the loose. On the night of April the 30th, which was about a week after the murders, law enforcement would get a break when someone called in and reported a red Jeep Liberty that appeared to be crashed off the side of the road, right here off the side of this road, where right here near Cleveland Road Elementary, right outside of Athens. Knowing that this Jeep Liberty fit the description of George's vehicle, the one that they had been looking for all this time, every officer in the county descended on Cleveland Road Elementary School, lights and sirens, and in massive numbers. 
when they got here to the scene they quickly cleared the vehicle and they determined that the vehicle was empty inside of the car they found several items one being george's passport which kind of made them feel a little bit better because now he couldn't leave the country but they found george's passport inside of the jeep they also found george's wallet that had 51 dollars inside they found a laptop computer a blackberry cell phone and just like a black bag that had six spent shell casings from a 38 caliber revolver in it then in one of the pockets of that black bag there was also an additional like thousand dollars in cash like a thousand fifty dollars something like that in cash that they found along with those items they also found two maps that had been printed off from mapquest.com and those two maps one of them was the address to tom tanner's home that was his wife's lover and then the other map was to the home of the other professor from here at the university of georgia who george had been fighting with over the previous few years obviously law enforcement believed that george had printed these maps off because he intended to go to these locations and kill these people but he wound up killing tom at the uh, community theater and i'm guessing that uh, he just abandoned the plan to kill this other professor after that because he knew the cops were going to be on to him pretty quickly now because of where law enforcement found george's jeep liberty it was out in the middle of nowhere so that raised some suspicions with law enforcement and they kind of immediately believed that he had to be out here in this wooded area somewhere there was no tire tracks no other car tracks or anything to make them think that he had driven off in another vehicle so officers were stationed with that vehicle overnight with the jeep liberty so that they could watch it and as soon as the sun came up the very next morning teams of officers started scouring this wooded area out here looking for george zinkin they believed wholeheartedly that he was out here in this wooded area for a whole week officers searched these woods they were lined up spaced apart just pacing through the woods they had canines out searching in the woods and they searched the woods for a whole week and found nothing just as law enforcement was about to give up they felt like they had searched enough to say well i guess he's not here after all on may the 9th two weeks after the murders a search team with cadaver dogs found a shallow grave about a mile away from where they found the jeep liberty out here in the woods and in that shallow grave they discovered the remains of george zinkin george spent his last hours alive digging a hole out here 18 inches deep and then he took a pallet laid it over the top of him that had where he had put sticks and leaves and other debris on it he laid it right on top of him and down inside of that hole he took a 38 caliber handgun and fired one shot into his head killing himself instantly that happened right here Athens two-week manhunt for George Zinkin was finally over it was clear that George had gone to great lengths to try to keep authorities from finding his remains but because of canine search teams he was finally discovered the investigation into this whole ordeal went on for quite a while after the discovery of George's body it took a long while to put all of the pieces together and to actually discover why George had done this now after the death of both parents the Zinkan children were sent off to live with their mother's relatives and over the years since the murders George's family has challenged the courts to try to get custody of these children now I mean they would be older now but throughout this while they were children George's family tried to get custody of them for years both families went back and forth in the court systems looking for custody and to date Marie's family still has custody of both of them now prior to all of this happening George and Marie both had wheels drawn up now this wasn't this wasn't something that George did right before he killed her this was done years prior it had nothing to do with the murders but they did have wheels drawn up 
George's brother Christian was named the executor of both of their wills, both George and Marie's wills. Now, as I said earlier in this video, the Zinken family, they were fairly rich. They were well off. And all of that money that was left over after they died, it was to go into an estate to cover any funeral expenses and legal representation and all of that. So from the time of the murders until now, those legal fees have almost completely drained the entire Zinken estate. On top of that, Tom Tanner's family also filed a lawsuit against the state, which took a lot more money out of it. And as it stands today, there's very little money left in that estate to go to the kids. As I said, it took some time for them to figure out all the details. They went through George's computer and they found everything uh, on that George had recorded on his wife, cheating on him and all that stuff. And then they put all the pieces together to, to say that it, apparently George did this because Marie was cheating on him and was about to leave him and it, and it broke his heart and it sent him into a, uh, a spiral, you know, and four people ultimately, including George, they lost their lives because of it. And then all of their families that they had and their children, uh, it affected a lot of people. That is going to do it for this episode today from here on the University of Georgia's campus and the triple murder slash suicide of George Zinken. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you're new here, go down, hit that subscribe button, then hit that notification bell so you get notified every time I upload a video. If you're one of those asking how you can help support the channel, there's links in the description box below, but really just hitting the thumbs up and watching the, my videos, that's all I can ask. That's all I do ask. That helps tremendously. Thank you all. I will see you again tomorrow. Please, all of you, stay safe and stay healthy. Much love to you all.